here. Uh, Diane Livnat's given a couple of uh, uh, shiurim to us in the past and in, from July onwards, once we, once we go into uh, uh, the new phase of the Chabura, Diane Livnat is going to be a staple. Whether he knows it or not, we, we need him and we are very, very excited uh, for future contributions of, ha of having someone teach us of his caliber. Diane Livnat serves as a Dayan on the Sephardi Beddin of London a graduate of the Eretz Chemda Institute for Advanced Jewish Studies in Yerushalayim. Dayan Livnat teaches in a number of programs for training rabbis and Dayanim, including the Semicha and Dayanut programs, run jointly by the Montefiore Endowment of London and Eretz Chemda. The Dayan is lecturer on Tanakh at the Yer Jerusalem College, and he's previously served in an artillery unit in the IDF, and is currently studying for a PhD in Jewish Studies at University College London. The Diane is also going to be um, featured in an event that I wanted to make sure the Habara members know about. I messaged it in the group and I, I'll, I'll be messaging it again about the, the conference of Dayanim that the Sephardi Beddin are hosting on Sunday. Um, the information will be shared. Our Rosh Bet Midrash, Rabbi Dweck, will be attending as well as, as, uh, alongside other uh, distinguished Hachamim. Um, Diane Livnat, thank you so much for being here again. We're very looking forward to tonight's Insights with you and the stage is yours. Okay, all right. So thank you, everyone. As you introduced, the learning is L'Rufua Shilema Shem Mordechai Ben Sanobar Betoch Shar Chole Israel. And uh, Diane Livnat, if I could just say, if everyone could please mute. Sorry. Uh, if you want, Diane Livnat, you can make me host just so I can mute anyone who comes in who hasn't muted. Okay, so here I'll make you co-host as well. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so tonight we're going to try and study a um, very, very difficult issue. The issue is going to be the status of halachot learned out from the Yud Gimel Midot Shatoran Idreshet Bem, the, the 13 um, principles by which the Chachamim derived halachot from analysis of the psukim of the Torah, the verses in the Torah. And this is one of these really at least the opinion of the Rambam here seems to be very uh, very difficult to, to try to grasp. It's one of these issues that when you study, you're pretty sure that what everybody's written is wrong, but you don't, you don't, you don't have an answer yourself to what is correct. It's just that every, what everybody says seems to be contradicted one way or another. My Rebbe in Yeshiva, Rav Yonatan Rosin, he has said in the past that if you're really struggling uh, with something, then the best way to try to get some understanding of it, on it is to, to give a shiur on it. Um, so that's a very high risk strategy, um, but uh, I don't recommend you run your stock portfolio that way. But if, if it works out at the end, then, then it can be very rewarding. So I hope that's what will happen tonight. Again, no guarantees, but we'll try. Okay, so, so what are we talking about? So basically anybody who studied um, uh, Gemara Talmud knows that a, a heavy proportion of the Talmud is dedicated to these kinds of discussions of what we call the Midot Shatoran Yidreshemem. The Midot Shatoran Yidreshemem is essentially uh, um, a certain type of techniques. There are some discussions exactly how many there are of them, um, and there are some arguments within Chazal themselves about some of them, how, to, how these techniques are going to be used. Uh, for those of us who say the, the Korbanot in the morning, so uh, we'll mention the Yud Gimel Midot Shatoran Yidreshet Ben, and 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 basically a lot of the Talmud is derived is speaking about that issue. In other words, this halacha, how it was there, according to the, even if there are disagreements, he learned it out from this pasuk because he derived it in this way. He learned it out from this pasuk, and a, a tremendous amount of the Talmud is dedicated just to these kinds of uh, derivations from sukim of halachot. Now it's it, the techniques are a bit surprising. <laughs> Look at them. We don't really understand how they work. It could be some sort of a. Um, some of them are more logical, logical to us. For example, a kal vachomer. Kal vachomer is, a, is a principle which is easier to understand because we say if in a lighter case this is the principle, then all the more so it should be in a more severe situation. So that's something that we can understand. But some of the others have to do with there might be an extra word or seemingly an extra word. So from the fact that there is an extra word, we can sort of derive a whole halacha. So granted, there might be an extra word here, 
but how do you from that infer the entire halacha that you're trying to infer? Or you have gzera shava, if this word appears here and it appears there, then we can, let's say we have a certain halacha by one subject, and then the same word appears in another subject, so we can derive from one to the other. Or sometimes the Torah will say something of a general rule and then give examples, so then there's this idea of klalu prat, and there are all kinds of rules on how to do that, so do you go by the general rule? Do you go just by the specific examples? Some of them are easier for us to understand, some of them more difficult. But generally, sort of the approach that has been taken is that this was something that was done by Chazam in the past. And even though we study the Gemara and we try and understand what they were doing, even though it doesn't say anywhere that we're not allowed today to use Yudgim and Midot Shatoran it doesn't say anywhere specifically that... Uh, that you're not allowed to come along and do your own learning out of halachot of, from by these techniques of Torah Midrash Abim. Nobody has done it really since since the Talmud has ended. Nobody has attempted to do it since because again, it, uh, apparently we have we have like for example by Gzera Shava, there's a limitation. Chazal say that's something you can't do unless you've received somehow by tradition from your ra or rabbi, whatever that means. But there's no law that says you're not allowed to do use Yudgim and Midot Shatoran Nidreshet Behen to derive halachot, but simply we don't do it because it seems to be that the understanding is that we don't really understand how Chazal did this, what they were doing. We don't, even though we try to sort of read and read about it, but we don't really fully grasp how this technique was used. And therefore we say that was something that was done in the past and nobody does it, has done it since. Now I'll just want, I just want to make a qualification on that. Sometimes people think that it, all we don't learn halachot from psukim anymore, that we only learn from Torah Shebaal Peh. That, in my opinion, is not precise. We do find Rishonim that learn halachot directly from psukim. It's not very common, but there are examples for it. The Rambam does it several places in the Mishneh Torah that he said he derives a certain halacha directly from a pasuk, from a verse, even though there's no source for it in Chazal. The Ramban, in his commentary on the Torah, also in a few places learns halachot directly from psukim. So it's not that the Torah Shebikhtav has been negated as a source for halacha. It still can be used and it has been used. It's, again, it's not very common because most of the 99.9% .9 of the work has been done already by Chazal, but it, it is done by Rishonim at, occasionally, but they're not using Yudim and Midot Shatoran Yidrashet They're using just their interpretation of the psukim. So that, that's something that we're more confident about. But to go ahead and, and use the human midot shatoran idreshet behem, that's something that's that sort of, it might return in the future, but it's not done anymore. I'll, I'll mention there is a bit of a resurgence recent in the recent re years of people who are trying to get more involved in, in how it's done, not to actually innovate halachot, but to try and understand there's a group two groups, at least, that I'm aware of in, in Israel that have sort of formed together to try to engage more in the Yudim and Midot Shatoran Yidoshimen. But as I said, it's, 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 it's not, uh, I think it's good that they're doing it and they publish some very interesting materials, but, um, but um, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a common, it's not a common feature anymore of our, our, our halachic process. So the question is, how to understand what was going on with Chazal, uh, with these Yudim and Midot Shatoran Yidreshet Behem, were they actually innovating halachot, or were they merely finding sources for halachot in, that they already received by tradition through these techniques? Uh, that's one question. And the second question, or the, the big primary question is, how to understand these halachot which are derived by these techniques? Do they have the status of Doraita? Uh, because they are derived from Sukim, so seemingly they should have the status of Torah law, or perhaps since they, if they are done uh, just by the Chachamim, then maybe they should be relegated as Halachot de Rabbana. Okay, so that's the question we're going to deal with. So um, we're, I'm going to just mention very quickly uh, two opinions, one of the Ralabag and the Ramban. Those are sort of the easy opinion, opinions to understand, and then we'll try to tackle the Rambam uh, who, as usual, causes us a lot of, uh, of um, uh, difficulty and aggravation in trying to understand what he's saying. Um, okay, so let's start with the Ralbag. The Ralbag is a very unique, unique opinion. I don't think it's the prevalent opinion at all, but it's nice to it's it's nice to to keep that opinion in, in your mind. Um, this is in the Ralbag. The Ralbag has a very very long 
a commentary on the Torah. He also has on the Tanakh. Um, so in his commentary on the Torah, he has an introduction where he sets out his, what his method of interpretation is going to be. And within that, he, he mentions the uh, and he says there as follows, because a lot of the commentary of the Ralbag on the halachic sections actually deals with halachot and how, how, um, how to derive them from the psukim. So he says, Okay, in other words, when we explain the mitzvot and the, the, the roots from which all the halachot, all the laws came about as explained in the Talmud, so he says, when I'll tell you the source of these halachot in the psukim, it's not going to be the source which the Talmud, the Chachmei Talmud that Chazal said is the source of the halachot, using the techniques of Yudgim and Midot. In other words, it could be that you'll have the same halacha, the Rabbag is not going to argue on halacha with Chazal, but when he presents in his interpretation the source of the halacha, he's going to bring a different source than what the Gemara brought as a source based on the technique of Yudim and Bidot. Why? What I mean. um, so he says, Okay, so he says, when Chazal were using these techniques of Yud Gimel, they weren't innovating halachot based on these techniques. These were all halachot ha-mekubalim lehem, which they received by tradition, and they were using the Yud Gimel Midot, these 13 principles, just to find some sort of hint or some sort of slight basis to it in the Psukim. Because if you were actually trying to create halachot based on these techniques, then there's no end to what you could do. You could turn over all the halachot of the Torah. You could even use the expression of letaheret asheretz, that you would have the ability to make something the sheretz, which we know is clearly tame, it states it's in the psukim, to make it tahor. So therefore, it cannot be that they were actually deriving halachot based on these principles, because then you could basically do whatever you want and anybody could make, make up any halacha that they want. Rather, they were just trying to find hints for the halachot that they received by traditions. Okay? But what we will do, he says, I'm going to provide other support for these halachot based on an interpretation of the pshat, the simple understanding of the text. Again, from which it's possible also to derive these halachot because this is more settling on the soul, on the heart. And this is not contradicting what Chazal said. So he says, I'm not contradicting Chazal. Chazal were not telling me that these are the source of the halachot. These, again, were things that they received by tradition. These were just hints, allusions that they found to it in the verses, but it's not the source. And he says, he claims here that this is also what the Rambam is understanding is, as we'll see, that's not at all uh, what the Rambam says. The Rambam says actually quite differently from the Ral Bag on this point, or at least somewhat differently. Okay, so just to sum up the opinion of the Ral Bag, and basically it's very interesting. He comes up in his own commentary, I think with his own, if I remember correctly, it's nine midot shatora nidreshet ben, which he thinks is more in a tune with the study of the pshat, and that's sort of how he derives all the same halachot of Chazal. He's not arguing with Chazal, but he tries to derive them in a more, uh, a method from the psukim, which is more attuned to a study of pshat, from a simple understanding of the text. So basically he says, the halachot were received by tradition. The Yudgim and Midot, the 13 principles, is just a technique to try to find some sort of hints to it in the psukim. There are places where the Gemara says that. The Gemara says regarding a few of these derivations, in other words, it's just a smach means it's sort of like 
something to, to rely upon. It's not the actual source, but the, the common understanding, as we'll see, which is not going to be the opinion of the Ramban, that's the exception to the rule. According to the Ralbag, that's the rule for all of the Arachot uh, stated in the Talmud as derived from the, the 13 principles. Okay, so that's the first opinion we have of the Ralbag. Second opinion of the Ramban, and this appears to be the, the more prevalent opinion, this more simple understanding. Anybody who learns Talmud gets the impression that this is so, like the Ramban says. Um, the, we're sort of jumping because the Ramban writes it as a critique, a response to the Rambam, but since it's a more, it's a sort of a more simple understanding, then we'll start from there. Uh, the Ramban claims that basically any halachot, the 13 principles are real, they're valid, they are a technique which Chachamim are deriving halachot by. It's not just halachot received by tradition. Some of them Chachamim are innovating based on these techniques. Uh, and that's why we have a lot of disagreements regarding them. However, once the halacha has been derived, since it's not like a Chacham is making a decree on his own, he is deriving it from the verses of the Torah, then it has the status of Torah law. Okay, let's see where he says this. I quoted here on the source pages, I quoted qu quite a bit of the Ramban, but it's actually still only a little bit of what he, um, of what he writes in his whole critique here of the Rambam. But um, I, I just quoted some of the highlights. He says here as follows. Um, I'm just reading here on the bottom page nine. He says, Avarikar Shorshea Talmud, all of them are considered to be Torah, words of Torah, Torah law. And they are considered to be the perush, the understanding, the, the commentary, the explanation of the Torah, which was given to Moshe and Sinai. Whether they received them specifically, in other words, that when you, Kiddushin is referring to something we'll discuss a bit more later, but Kiddushin, when you want to be Mekadesh a woman, which is to betroth her, which is actually the way marriage is done by the Torah, so there are different ways that you can do it. So the one which is sort of explicit in the Psukim is, that you have relations with her. However, we know, as the first Mishnah in Kiddushin say, says that you can do it also with kesef, with something of monetary value, which is what we do with the ring, or we can do it with a star by giving her a document which states that you have been Mekadesh or that you have betrothed her. Okay, now these kesef and star, they're learned out from a technique of Yud Gimel Midot Shatoran Idreshet Ben, because by kesef we learn it out by Akzera Shava, it says, Ki Kachi Shisha, and when Avram Avinu buys the field from Ephron, it says, Natati kesef asadeh kach mimeni. So it uses the same expression as kicha. So therefore, they learn here it can be money, here it's also money. Bishtar v'yatsa v'yaita, just like a woman is divorced by a document. The get, so too she can be uh, betrothed by a document. Um, so he says, this is halacha, which we received by tradition, but we can also find a source for it through the techniques. So this is another example of a halacha which was given by tradition from Sinai. For example, even though the Torah just says, do not cook milk with meat, we learn that by tradition that it applies also not just to cook, but also not to eat and not to derive benefit. And also that it's not limited to a kid in its mother's milk, but rather to any other domesticated kosher animal with milk of a domesticated kosher animal. And we also have a way to derive this from the Midot Torani Dreshet Ben as the Gemara and Masechet Hulin does. Uben rulo advarim stam, so he says the other type is where the halacha was not received by tradition, but the rules of using the 13 principles, they were given. 
So according to the Ramban, and by the way, as we'll see, the Rambam does not disagree with the Ramban at this point, they received the 13 principles were also given to Moshe in Sinai, that Moshe was taught, and this was the tradition that he passed on, these are the principles which you use to interpret the Torah, to derive halachot from the Torah. So it, it can be used for halachot that you already know, because I told you those halachot specifically, but it can also be used to derive new halachot uh, using these principles. So that's why these halachot are considered to be Torah law, because even though they weren't given in terms of their specific content, the technique by which they are derived was given in the oral tradition from Moshe to Sinai. So since, for example, you have the, um, uh, the, the tradition was given to Moshe that you can use a gzera shava, an identical word that appeared to derive a certain halacha. So therefore, even though that halacha specifically was not taught, since the method by which it was derived was given to Moshe and Sinai, therefore the halacha itself that is derived, once the Chachamim come to some sort of an agreement and ruling on what halacha specifically is to be derived from it, and then that's also considered to be Torah law. And, and what he says at the end, yes, there are cases where Chachamim said this is just an asmachta. In other words, it's just a hint. This is not really the source. Um, like, for example, a classical example of, uh, of such a case where we have an asmachta is, um, uh, well, there are many examples, but uh, like, for example, all the shiurim, the sizes. So Chachamim found a hint to it in the Shivat Aminim, Eretz Chita Besora. It's all a hint to the different sizes in the Torah. So there, the Chachamim say that's just an asmachta. The Shiurim were received by tradition. We didn't really derive it from the worst. But, and there are other cases as well. But the Ramban says, though there's the exception to the rule, if you have not been told that it's an asmachta, then it's not an asmachta, it's a proper derivation, and whatever was derived by the 13 principles is Torah law. And again, as I said, this seems to be the sort of the simple prevalent understanding. If you read, if you learn the Gemara, it seems that they're taking all these derivations very seriously. They're arguing about it. And it seems that all the halachot that are learned out are considered uh, to have Torah status as the Oraita, uh laws. And like the Ramban says, it doesn't seem like they're just approving halachot that they received by tradition. It seems that they're actually innovating halachot because it says this Chacham came and he, this Amora or this Tana, and he learned it out from here. And then somebody else argued with him. No, you, you should learn out this from that. So it seems like they were actually actively engaging in producing halachot rather than just you know trying to prove whatever they received by tradition. But on the other hand, it does seem that since it's derived from the verses that it does have Torah law. Okay, so those are the, the two opinions. Um, that I wanted to start out with. Now let's try and tackle the Rambam. Okay, so again, we're now, where does the Rambam write on this? So the, he writes on it on several places. The primary place that he writes on it, as we will see, is in his introduction to Sefer HaMitzvot. As I mentioned in the previous Shulim, in the introduction to Sefer HaMitzvot, again, the Rambam wanted to produce his, produce his even though there were lists of 613 mitzvot, which preceded the Rambam. The Geonim had many lists. The Rambam disagreed with all their lists. He claimed that they just listed mitzvot randomly. There was no method to how they decided what should be counted as a mitzvah or not. So therefore, he, he compiled his own list of 613 mitzvot. The reason he wanted to do that, he writes, is that that will serve as the basis for the Mishneh Torah. For, because again, he was... <laughs> he was the first one to do it and the last one so far to attempt to write a book, the entire code of Jewish law. Nobody's attempted to do it since. Uh, even the Shulchan Aruch is not on the entire, many, many halachot are left out from the Shulchan Aruch. Tumavet Kodashim, we could go on. Shulchan Aruch only deals with practical halachot nowadays. The Rambam dealt with everything. So, <clears throat> he, so therefore he writes that he needs to set out the 613 mitzvot and that will serve as the basis because he wants to write on all the mitzvot. So he first has to list them, and then he can expand and write his, his major work, the Mishneh Torah, uh, on all of the mitzvot. Now, in order to count properly the 613 mitzvot, the Rambam says there has to be a method to it. You can't just randomly list mitzvot. You have to come up with the method, the criteria, by which you define what is a mitzvah and what is not. So in his introduction to Sefer HaMitzvot, he lays out 14 principles. They are commonly known as shorashim, roots, the 14 principles by which 
you decide how a mitzvah is enumerated. So the first uh, shorish we discussed in the last time I gave a shiru, it was some time ago, and that's the Rambam said, we do not list mitzvot that are the Rabbanan. Okay, so for example, we have a mitzvah the Rabbanan upcoming soon to read the Megillat Esther. The Geonim, some of them listed it in, the, in their list of 613 mitzvot. The Rambam said, not possible. 613 mitzvot are mitzvot min ha-Torah. Megillah is clearly a mitzvah de Rabbanan, cannot be listed. And last time we had a whole nice discussion about what exactly is the status of mitzvot de Rabbanan, how binding are they? Second, now his second principle is, as we'll see, is do not list anything which is derived from the 13 principles um, of derivation, the Yudgim and Midot Shatorani Dreshadbem, anything which was derived by the Yudgim and Midot Shatorani Dreshadbem cannot be listed amongst the 613 mitzvot. Okay, that's going to be a second principle. And here he's going to get into a whole discussion of what exactly is this these uh, 13 principles about. Okay, so let's read it and then we'll try and uh, try and explain it at least as best as we can in the time that we have. <clears throat> so he says as follows, jumping up to the top of the source pages here, I found a translation to English in the Safaria website. So I tried to lay it out parallel to the Hebrew. Again, as you can see, <laughs> English is a much longer language than Hebrew. Um, so he says as follows, כבר בארנו בפתיחת חיבורנו בפירוש המשנה שרוב דיני התורה יצאו בשלוש עשרה מידות שהתורה נדרשת בהם. אוקיי, okay, so he says, I've already laid out in my commentary to the Mishnah, most of the halachot of the Torah have been derived by these 13 principles. ושהדין היוצא במידה מאותן המידות הנה פעמים תיפול בו המחלוקת. And things which are derived by these 13 principles, at times there will be disagreement amongst the Chachamim regarding these laws. ושיש שם דינים, הן פירושים מקובלים ממשה, אין מחלוקת בהם. אבל הם מביאים ראייה להן באחת משלוש עשרה מידות, כי מחוכמת הכתוב ההוא שאפשר שימצא מורה מזמורה על הפירוש שהוא מקובל, או היקש יורה עליו וחובר בענו, זה העניין שם. אוקיי, זה סימילר למה שאנחנו ראינו ברמב"ן קודם, שכמה מההלכות י"ג למידות שהתורה נדרשת בהן, הן אינובציות של חכמים, and some are actually just finding a basis for a halakha, a law that we already know by tradition. Now, this is a key point in the Rambam because the Rambam, what he, tried, what he goes at length to claim there in his introduction to his commentary on the Mishnah, is that any halakha which was received by tradition, there cannot be disagreement about because, you know, that's the tradition. So you, if, you, if you know this halakha from tradition, what's there to argue about? So he claims, any time that we find a machloket in the Chachamim regarding something, it cannot be regarding a halacha which we received by tradition. Because once anybody comes along and says, not anybody, but you know, somebody who is involved in receiving the tradition of the Torah Shebaal Peh, says, I have the tradition that this is the halacha. End of story. No more arguing. You cannot argue with a tradition. So therefore, he says, all the halachot we received by tradition, there is no machloket on. If you see a machloket regarding something, then it's a halacha which chachamim are innovating using these 13 principles, but they're nevertheless innovating. And there you could, there, there they could have disagreements. So therefore, some of them are tradition, there is no machloket on, but they'll still use the 13 principles to find also a basis for it in the psukim. And some of them <coughs> weren't received by tradition, they were innovated by chachamim, and therefore there are disagreements regarding them. אוקיי, okay, and therefore, he says, וכשיהיה זה כן, הנה לא כל מה שנמצא לחכמים שהוציאו בהיקש משלוש עשרה מידות, נאמר שהוא נאמר למשה בסיני, ולא גם כן נאמר בכל מה שיימצא בשלוש עשרה מידות שיסמכו אל אחת משלוש עשרה מידות שהוא דרבנן. כי פעמים יהיה הפירוש ההוא מקובל ממשה מסיני, לפי הראוי בזה. שכל מה שלא תמצאו כתוב בתורה, ותמצאו בתלמוד שלמדו באחת משלוש עשרה מידות, אם באמרו הם בעצמם ואמרו שזה גוף תורה או שזה דאורייתא, הנה ראוי למנותו, אחר שהמקובלים ממנו אמרו שהוא דאורייתא. ואם לא יבארו זה ולא דיברו בו, הנה הוא דרבנן שאין שם כתוב יורה עליו. 
Okay, so what does he said here? He said as follows. So therefore, any time I find something which is derived by these 13 principles, I cannot automatically say that it's from the Torah, nor can I automatically say that it's the Rabbana. It depends. If I see this halacha that they've derived from the 13 principles, but Chachamim themselves are telling me, this is a guf Torah, or this is the Oraita, Therefore, he never will him the Therefore, I should count it as one of the 613 weeks vote. Why? Because they told us that it's the Oraita. But if they haven't told me that it's the Oraita, if they've never said that it's the Oraita, then it is the Rabbanan. Why is it the Rabbanan? Very important words here. She'ein sham katuv yorealav. Because there is no verse, there's no pasuk in the Torah, which instructs us it. Okay? So, uh, okay, let, let's we'll just take, take this for now. In other words, basically, the Rambam understands that anything derived from Yud Gimel Midot, it's not considered as if it's written in the Torah. Therefore, it really should be the Rabbanan, unless the Chachamim came along and told me that it is uh, from the Torah. And therefore, and if Chachamim says it's from the Torah, then it's from the Torah. Okay, now this, this is a bit strange. Okay, we can already see it's a bit strange what's going on here because if you're saying the criteria, you're, say, you're telling me the criteria for something to be from the Torah is that it's written in the Psuki. Okay, so that's assumption A. Second assumption, the fact that I derived it from the Yud Gimel Midot does not make it as if it's written in the Psuki. Assumption B. So therefore, it's not from the Torah. So therefore, it must be the Rabbana. Then how come if the Chachamim come along and tell me that it is Minat Torah, then it is Minat Torah? How, how does that magic occur? If, if it, it contradicts the, the, the first two uh, principles that you said, that for something to be Minat Torah, it has to be written. Okay, so that's, that's already we're starting to see that we're having difficulties here with the Rambam. But okay, let's, let's, let's bear with him. Okay, so basically he said, Yud Gimel Midot, if Chachamim told me that it's Minat Torah, then it's Minat Torah, I'll list it amongst the 613 mitzvot. If they didn't say it, then it's the Rabbanan, and therefore I do not list it amongst the 613 mitzvot. Next. Um, okay. Vezeh um, Gamken, now here he goes, he moves, he shifts to attack uh, again, one of the counters of the mitzvot in the geonim, this is what he often does. He lays out a principle, and then he starts to attack his predecessors, the geonim, and their lists. So he says, This is a principle that always confused uh, somebody else. In other words, in the, and he listed fear of the Chachamim as a positive command. Where does it say that you should fear the Chachamim? It doesn't say that anywhere. So he says, So the commandment to fear the Chachamim is derived from the 13 principles. How is it derived? Because it says, The word et seems to be uh, unnecessary, it seems to be extra redundant, it should have just said Hashem Elokech Atira so Rabbi Akiva came along and said the et comes to also include Talmidei Chachamim, that you should also fear or have it be in awe, not just of Hashem, but also of the of the Chachamim, so that's a derivation of Yud Gimel Midot and therefore the Baal Alachot Gedolot listed it as one of the 613 mitzvot the Rambam comes along and says, no, that's a mistake. It was only derived by uh, the 13 principles. Therefore, it doesn't actually state it explicitly in the Pasuk. So therefore, it should not be counted. And he says, in other words, he says to the, he says, you should have counted many other mitzvot. Uh, for example, because 
חכמים said, כבד את אביך, why does it say את אביך, it should have just said כבד אביך, it comes to include your big brother. Okay, this is probably the halacha that my brother-in-law likes to quote all the time, he's always yelling at his sisters, כבד את אביך לרבות את אחיך הגדול. Okay, so that should have also been listed, if you're listing everything which is derived from the 613 mitzvot, you should have listed that as well. Um, okay, and he continues, Okay, they've come into either a greater or even mistake more than this. Okay, there's a double O here. In other words, sometimes there are things which are derived by these 13 principles, which the Rambam says are definitely the Rabbanan, and nevertheless, they, the Geonim, will count them as mitzvot. In other words, he says that by learning out counting these things, which are these mitzvot, which are derived from the Yudim and Midot, they are actually contradicting the statement of Chazal, Ein mikra pshuto. This is very interesting, okay? The Rambam understands that the pshat, Ein mikra pshuto, the pshat, the sort of the simple understanding of the text, that's the authoritative ruling of the Torah. And if what's derived by the Yudim and Midot Shatoran Yidreshet Behem does not fit in with what we would call the Pashtei Dekra, the simple understanding of the text, therefore it cannot be Min HaTorah. It has to be Mide Rabbana. Okay? In other words, the Rambam is sort of, what he's doing here, he's really, he's sort of telling us what's the problem with, with the Yudim and Midot Shatoran Yidreshet Behem, why they cannot be Min HaTorah, unless with the Chazal tell us that they're men Torah, the problem is that they do not fit in with Pashtei Dekra. They do not fit in with the what seems to be the simple meaning of the Psukim. Only the Pashtei Dekra is considered the Mitzvah Torah, and that's what Chazal meant when they said En Mikra Yotze Midei Pshuto. Okay, let's go on. And now he gives an example of such a situation. He says, "Vanismachim b'machshava zo manu bechlal mitzvot bikur cholim v'nichum aveli mukvurat metim ba'avur adrasha niskar ba'amroit barach v'odat alehem et aderech yelchu ba v'amru et aderech zog milut chasadim yelchu ze bikur cholim ba ze kvurat metim v'et ma'ase elu adinim asher yasun zo lifnim meshurat adin v'chashvu ki kol pol u'pula me'elu apulot mitzvah b'fnei atzma." ולא ידעו כי אלה הפועלות כולם ודומים להם נכנסות תחת מצווה אחת מכל המצוות הכתובות בתורה בביאור והוא אמרו יתברך ואהבת לרעך כמוך. In other words, there is a verse, ועודתם להם את הדרך ילכו בה. From this verse Chazal derived all kinds of things which you should do, including go visit the sick, go comfort the mourners, bury the dead, do chesed acts of kindness and charity. So he says, all of these things, first of all, it says just vodatem lahem et aderech yelchuba, teach them the way that they should go. It's a very general verse. You can't derive specifically from this verse. There might be a slight hint, maybe somehow to visiting the sick and you know comforting the mourners. But it's not the, the, the sort of seems to be the, the, the simple understanding of the verse. So they listed all of these, each one as a mitzvah bifne atzma. The Rambam says, no, they're not a mitzvah bifne atzma. They all, the only thing that the Torah says and you can fit all of these under that umbrella is ve'ahavta l'recha kamocha. You should love uh, um, your friend as you do yourself. So if you love him, then you'll go visit him when he's sick and you'll comfort him and you'll bury the dead and do acts of kindness, etc. But there's no commandment, separate commandment on each one of these acts. Okay, he gives another example of a, a case where they listed something which does not fit with the Pashtei Dekra, the simple understanding of the text. Okay, so I'm skipping to here. Now he says, 
להיותן בלתי אמיתיות והיות הדין היוצא במידה אי אמת או בלתי אמת, אין זו הסיבה. So in other words, maybe now somebody will come and say, oh, the reason why you don't want to count these is because you think they're not true. Says the Rambam, no, he says they're true. There's no doubt to their truth. He says, אבל הסיבה היא, כי כל מה שיוציא אדם ענפים מן השורשים שנאמרו לו למשה בסיני בבירור והם תרי"ג מצוות, ואפילו היה מוש, מוציא משה בעצמו, אין ראוי למנותם. In other words, he says it's not a matter of truth. They could be definitely true. They could have been said already by Moshe Rabbeinu himself. But the very fact that it's not what we call נאמרו למשה בסיני בבירור, it's not explicit in the Torah, that's what makes it that I can't count it. In other words, it's not a matter of truth or not. The, matter, the question is, is it written in the Torah? If it's not written in the Torah, again, on the pshat understanding of the Torah, it cannot be counted. Okay, and he brings more, more proofs for this idea. Uh, let's just see his conclusion. He says, הנה כבר התבאר כי תרי"ג מצוות שנאמרו לו למשה בסיני לא ימנה מהן כל מה שילמד בשלוש עשרה מידות ואפילו בזמנו עליו השלום כל שכן שלא ימנה בהן כל מה שהוציאו באחרית הזמן. אוקיי? Okay? So he says you cannot count anything derived by the 13 מידות certainly you cannot derive what is learned later on אבל אמנם ימנה מה שהיה בפירוש מקובל ממנו והוא שיעברו המתיקים ואמרו שזה הדבר אסור לעשותו ואיסורו דאורייתא, או יאמרו שהוא גוף תורה, הנה נמנה אותו, כי הוא נודע בקבלה ולא בהיקש, ואומנם זוכרו ההיקש בו והביאו ראי עליו באחת משלוש עשרה מידות, להראות חוכמת הכתוב כמו שבארנו בפירוש המשנה. He says the exception to the rule is where חכמים told us that this is מן התורה. If they told us that it's מן התורה, we have the tradition that this is מן התורה, then we'll count it even though it's, it's derived by the 13 principles, because in this case, The 13 principles are not the actual source of it. They're just a, a, a method to show where it appears in the Torah, but really it, it's, it's, uh, it's not based on the, just on the Gimel Midot uh, Torah uh, Somebody asked in the chat what to do about the fact that there is no consensus on the Taryag. Um, there is a consensus that there are 613 mitzvot. There just isn't a consensus on what they are. So... There's not much we can do about it. That's the fact. There is no consensus. Okay. So, some of the, the arguments are really usually just about, you know, what criteria you use to count a mitzvah. Even if you follow all the Rambam's criteria, you could still get, still get into arguments. And certainly, apparently, others didn't agree with that criteria. So that's because Chazal, all they said is that there are 613 mitzvot. They never actually made, produced a list. So that's why we have a lot of disagreements on that. Okay, so let, let's, try, let's try and analyze what we saw in the Rambam because it's, it's, really, it's really somewhat difficult. Basically, what he said is as follows. Again, you sort of, on the one hand, he's speaking about seemingly a very limited subject, which is, um, wait, somebody's also asking, maybe the concept of 613 itself was a just a drasha. Look, if that's a whole other topic, but again, that's something the Ramban deals with at length. He raises that possibility, maybe this whole 613 is just one opinion, maybe it's just a drasha, et cetera. But then he comes to the conclusion that since it's so unanimous in Chazal, that it is an accepted feature. So it's that's something you could debate, but, but um, um, another question is, when the Rambam says 13 midot, does he include in the same category all ribuim do you came through which the laws are derived. There is a discussion on that point. I did see an article that I was reading today. Uh, I actually put it in, uh, if somebody wants, I can share it. Um, that had a little bit of discussion. Maybe there are certain types of things learned out from the 13 midot which are not included. To my understanding, it all comes down to the following. As the Rambam here said, is it what we include in Pashte Dekra or not? If it's not included in Pashte Dekra, in the simple understanding of the text, and we'll soon discuss what that means, then it's automatically relegated into Yud Gimel Midot Shatoran Yidreshet Ben. So I don't think it matters so much. It's from the 13 principles or maybe from another. The bottom line is, can I fit this into the understanding of the text or not? If I can, then it's that's the understanding of the text. If I cannot, then it automatically becomes sort of this other category, whatever that is. 
Okay, so let, let's try to analyze. We don't have that much time, but let's try to try and think about what we saw. So <clears throat> what is the Rambam saying essentially? So he said that, that, that in, basically, if, if, we're, if, we, if we think about just in the limited sense of how you count 613 mitzvot, basically he said, I'll only count in the 613 mitzvot something which fits in with Pashtay Dekra, what he calls the simple understanding of the text. Uh, anything which is not, I won't, unless Chachamim tell me explicitly that it should be, that it is Min HaTorah. Okay? Now, that's a statement which is difficult on its own. Why is it difficult on its own? Because there are certain mitzvot which are counted, even though they do not fit in with what we would call Pashtay Dekra. They do not seem to be the simple understanding of the text. Um, but okay, that's that's one problem that we have. That's one objection that the Ramban lists. Maybe to that, you know, we could deal with somewhat easily if we somehow shift a bit on our understanding of what Pashte Dekra means. So that's one point. Second point is, okay, if that's your criteria for counting mitzvot, what does it help that Chachamim come, came and tell, told me that it's Mina Torah? What, what does that change? If you're defining that for me to list it amongst the 613 mitzvot, it has to be written somewhere in the Torah, then that's the definition. What is the tradition? What is Chachamim coming along and telling me that this is Mina Torah? How does that change things? Okay, that's the second issue we have with the Rambam. Now, the third and biggest issue that we have here with the Rambam, with the Rambam is that he says, he didn't just say, we read him carefully, he didn't just say, don't count it amongst the 613 mitzvot. He also added in, he threw in a bomb here, that he said that it's the Rabbanan. Okay? Now, if he's relegating every all the halachot that we learned from the 13 midot that Torah nidreshet behem to be the Rabbanan, then we have some major, major problems. Because again, the Rambam himself said most of the halachot learned out that appear in the Talmud are learned out by the 13 principles. Most of them, we do not have Chachamim coming and by and say explicitly their man, Mina Torah. So it would seem to be that all of those all of a sudden become relegated to just being the Rabbanan. Now that's a very big problem. First of all, it doesn't fit in with the simple reading of the Talmud. Secondly, it doesn't fit in with the Rambam himself because he quotes endless of these halachot and he doesn't say about them that they are the Rabbanan. There are places that he says the Rabbanan. But those are sort of, uh, and we'll discuss a little bit, but those are sort of the exception to the rule. Most of the halachot seem to be mina Torah, I'll give, seem to be Doraita. I'll give you the most famous example, perhaps. The Rambam writes, origi wrote originally, he later on, there, he changed his mind on if there's a, a tshuva of his son, the Rabbi of Rambi the Rambam. But this is something quite famous. And I also brought, brought here in the sources a little bit about it, that he wrote that Kiddushay Kesif, that when you are betrothed a woman, you do kiddushin on a woman with something of monetary value, like you do with a ring, that idea of doing kiddushi kesef, since it's derived by the 13 principles, uh, that's the Rabbanan. Okay? Now, the question is, what does that mean? So if I, if I, anytime I do kiddushin with a ring, uh, the woman is only mekudesh, we're only married me the Rabbanan, is that really correct? From the Rambam itself, it's it's evident that not. He said specifically, once you've done kiddushin, even with something of monetary value, now they're married, mina Torah, it's forbidden, punishable by death for her to have relations with another man. They need to get the works. It clearly cannot be the Rabbana. So that's the the probably the the biggest the biggest issue that we have with the um, with what the Rambam writes that everything learned out from. The 13 principles is the Rabbanan. How can that be? That seems to contradict endless, endless halachot. And that's sort of the, the biggest critique that the Ramban writes against the Rambam, that it cannot be that everything that we learn out from the 13 principles is only the Rabbanan. Okay, so how to, how to understand all of this? So we'll start with the last question. Regarding the last question, basically there are two approaches that, again, this is something which endless articles has been written about already from the earlier commentaries of the Rambam till today, including my, my late Rosh Hashivah, Rav Nachum Rabinovich wrote about it extensively. Basically, there are two approaches that have been taken. 
<clears throat> both of them highly problematic. One is to say that even though the Rambam wrote that it's the Rabbanan, all he meant was that the source who said it is the Chachamim. In other words, what he meant was just that since it's not stated explicitly in the Torah, it was stated by Chachamim using these techniques. Therefore, he calls it the Rabbanan, but really it has the power and authority of something, of any other halacha from the Torah. Why? Because ultimately, like the Ramban said, it is learned out from verses. So therefore, the source, whoever said it, is the Rabbanan. In other words, it's the Chachamim in terms of the source. But the authority, the power of the law is the same as any Torah law. And that's how they sort of <coughs> want to solve uh, this, whole, this whole problem. Okay, so that's, that's one approach that uh, can be taken. The, the problem with that approach is that, first of all, it doesn't seem to fit um, the simple reading of the Rambam. And also, there are also some other specific problems in various cases that they, that they address that it seems to contradict this, this explanation. But that's one approach that you can take, and that's sort of the most common and widespread approach. Again, that even they will tell you it is so you'll ask, so what's the significance that it's the Rabbanan? If it has the power of a Torah, now what's the significance? So they give several significance to it. Perhaps the most primary one is that it can be changed. The Rambam writes in Yilchot Mamrim that if one Beidin comes along and derives Aracha from the 13 principles, then a later Beidin can use the 13 principles to derive a different Aracha and change the previous Aracha. So that's so they'll tell us, once it's derived, it has the principle of a Torah law, but it can also be changed by another Beidin later on, because again, since the source, it wasn't received by tradition, the source is Chachamim, so therefore it can be changed by a later Beidin that will use the 13 principles differently. Okay, so that's one approach. Second approach says, no, when the Rambam said it's the Rabbanan, he really meant it's the Rabbanan, and all the endless halachot that seem to indicate that it's Mina Torah, somehow we'll find all kinds of solutions to work out all of them. Needless to say, they haven't really found solutions. That approach really hasn't found solutions for all of them. They've given certain examples of possible solutions, but that's also a, a very, very difficult approach. Okay, so we only have five minutes left, so I'll try to say a little bit, a few points of, of my two cents on, on this. Okay, so let's start out with the first question. The first question was, um, let's see, we're here. How would the Rambam classify Al Hamosh Is this part count of the 613 and deemed to the No, the Rambam says it all depends. Even Halachot Le Moshe Misinai, if they have a source in the verses, then they will be counted. If they don't have a sources, he also says, he also calls them the Rabbanan. Even though they were given by Hashem to Moshe and Misinai, since they're not written in the Torah, he considers them, he calls them the Rabbanan as well. Okay, very interesting. The Rambam is very extreme. Min HaTorah can only but, doesn't matter if Hashem himself is the source. It, it has to be written in the, the Torah for it to be considered Midoraita. Okay, so I'll try to briefly touch on some of the questions that we mentioned. So, uh, uh, okay, so let's try and take the first question. First question we said, what is this idea of Pashtay Dekra about? So we usually, when we think of Pashtay Dekra, the simple understanding of the text, we think of when we read, let's say, Rashbam or Ibn Ezra, right? The commentators which really try to understand the simple reading of the text. I don't think that's what the Rambam here meant. And we can bring a lot of proofs for this. I'll just share with you one quick proof. This was actually one of the questions of the uh, Ramban on the Rambam. We have one of the mitzvot that the Rambam lists is that relatives cannot serve as witnesses one on each other. Okay, it appears here the mitzvah reish peizayin. He she isira dayan mikabel edut akrovim ktsatam aktsatam o ktsatam im ktsatam vuhu amroi tale lo yumtu avot al banim u banim lo yumtu al avot. If you read that entire verse, what does it say there? It means that a person only dies for his sins. He doesn't die for the sins of his fathers. That's the simple reading of the text. 
Not only is that the simple reading of a text, this verse is actually quoted in the book of Divrei Amim with that meaning, that sons are not killed for the sins of the father and fathers are not killed for the sins of the sons. Nevertheless, that serves as the source that fathers are not killed by the testimony of the sons and sons are not killed by the testimony of the fathers. Okay, even though that's not what we would call the simple understanding of the text, that is the halachic understanding of the text, and therefore it's listed amongst the 613 mitzvot, and it is considered min ha-Torah. Why? Because again, when the Rambam was talking about Pashtay Dekra, he wasn't necessarily talking about the simple, simple understanding of the text, as let's say the Rosh Bam attempts to do in his commentary on the Torah, he was talking about the simple understanding of the, the text as interpreted by the Torah Shebaal Peh. And here the, the oral tradition interpreted this verse to mean this, then this is the interpretation of the text. What would be a Yud Gimel Midot, which is the Rabbanan versus this text? The Rambam gives an example. The text only says, Fathers by the sins of the son, sins of the fathers. What would be relatives from the mother side of the family, the maternal side of the family? Those are all in the Gemara learned out. However, the Rambam calls all of those derabanan. Why? Because those don't even conform with the halachic interpretation of the text. Because all the halachic interpretation of the text said was, Sons are not killed by the fathers. Fathers are not killed by the son. There is no mention of the maternal family. Therefore, that's all relegated to the Rabbanan. So first point is, Pashte Dekra is the halachic interpretation of the text. Can you allow me two, three minutes to go over my time? Is that okay? Just to finish. Okay. Yeah, Second, right. I apologize. I really, I usually try not to do it, but I just, I just, just to finish the thought. Second point is the Rambam said that Chachamim, if Chachamim will tell me that something is from the Torah, I will list it. Even though it doesn't appear in the Psukim, it's only Yudgim and Midot Torah Nidreshet Bahem. In a tshuva, which I quoted here, we won't read it aside now, the Rambam says there are only three or four such cases. That's all. Okay? In other words, and we can find them in Sefer HaMitzvot. I'll, give, I'll just mention one example. Yai Nesich, the prohibition of drinking wine, which has been sacrificed by a non-Jew to idolatry. Um, there's no source for it explicit in the Psukim. It doesn't say it anywhere. We know from Halakha that's in Yisur Torah. The Rambam lists it in Sefer HaMitzvot. He says, even though the source is only Yud Gimel Midot Torah Nidreshet Bahem, I have to list it because Chachamim said it's Guf Torah. But, he, but there are only three or four such examples. So I don't think we should be that concerned about it. Those are what we would call the exception to the rule. Right, the fact, if you have a rule, sometimes we think that if you have a rule which doesn't work 100% of the time, it only works 99% of the time, then there's something wrong with the rule. It doesn't have to be the case. You have 613 mitzvot, out of them, six or 609 and 600 or 610 fit to this rule, that's good enough. The fact that I have three or four exceptions, not so bad, okay? We can, we can handle that. Okay, that's regarding that point. I wouldn't read too much into that, those are just sort of the aberrations to the rule. It's not, it's not a problem. Last question. Is it the Rabbanan or the Oraita? Okay, and this is the, the most difficult part. But here, I think what the Rambam would say, if you gather all the information, he says, just the fact that it's derived by the 613 mitzvot cannot make it Mina Torah. As we said, because Mina Torah, according to the Rambam, has to list, be listed specifically in the Tzukim. Anything which is not listed in the Psukim is automatically not Mina Torah. But what does that mean? So just the fact that I learned it out from 613 mitzvot cannot make it Mina Torah. However, it could still be on Min Torah for a different account. How is that possible? Because you have to sort of see what this halacha is telling me. Is this halacha interpreting a certain detail in a mitzvah Mina Torah? or it's coming to add something else. So if, for example, the Torah said, you have to do kiddushin to a woman, you have to betroth the woman. So it could be that I'll use the Yudgim and Midot Torah Nidresh them to learn out that um, I, I can do it with something of monetary value. But ultimately what I've learned out is 
that this is a way to do Kiddushin. And since the concept of Kiddushin is Mina Torah, then that also becomes a Torah law. However, if I'm using the Yud Gimel Midot to add on to something, onto the Torah, like the example I, I mentioned earlier, I'm adding, let's say the Torah said, sons and fathers cannot serve as witnesses to each other. The Gemara learns out that also your wife's family also cannot, by somehow you give me the Torah and you That's adding on to the verses. So that cannot be considered Midat Torah. That's only Midat Rabbanan. Again, that doesn't mean it's not authoritative. It is authoritative. But ultimately, the Rambam's criteria is that something for something to be Midat Torah, it has to be Midat Torah. So I think if you sort of take all the things together, you have to sort of check each halacha on its own account. Is it interpreting a detail within the mitzvah Minat Torah? Or it's coming to add something beyond the scope of the basic principle of the Torah, which would all, which would relegate it to be um, uh, the Rabbanan. Okay, so that's in very briefly my, my thoughts on this issue. I hope that that made a little bit. Uh, that. Thank you so so much for that. Very 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 insightful and fascinating to see. <laughs> Uh, a few different opinions. I'd, I'd love to see what questions there are. Um, okay. Anybody wants to unmute, and ask any questions? Go ahead and do so, please. Who's first? Oh, had go ahead. According to the Ramban, who says that all uh, derivations essentially are uh, deoraita, then according to him, what is this idea of en onshim minadin? If it's deoraita, then why not? Yes, Enon Shin Minadin, according to the Ramban, is a very much more limited concept than the Rambam understood it. The Rambam understood it as referring to all 13 Midot Shatoran Ben. Um, this, is, this ties into what I was speaking about, but we didn't have the time to deal with it tonight. According to the Rambam, it applies to all 13 Midot Shatoran Ben. According to the Ramban, it's only limited to a Kalva Chomer. A Kalva Chomer is sort of where you say, well, if the Torah punishes in this case, then this is much more severe than I should also punish in this case. So he says, by punishments, Kalva Homer, that system of Kalva Homer doesn't work by punishments, but it's only limited to Kalva Homer. It doesn't apply to, to any of the other 13 Midot, according to the Ramban. That's, that's well, by the way, the understanding of most Rishonim, that it's just limited to a Kalva Homer, that concept. What would be the logic for limiting just Kalva Homer? It's sort of that. It has to do with how you understand punishments. In other words, you're saying, well, if you punish you, let's say you give the death penalty for this, then, well, this seems to be more severe. So certainly I should give the death penalty for that. But it's sort of saying, you know, punishments is, you know, it's the, the, the logic behind punishments is sort of something beyond us. We cannot make this judgment that we think this is more severe. Whatever the Torah instituted punishments, that's what we have. You cannot add on to it. But if you'll derive mm -hmm. a punishment by the other principles, that's fine, according to Rambam. It's only the Kalva Chomel that he's objecting to, because that's like a Mida, which is more based on logic than a derivation from the text itself. And, and according to the Rambam, the entire halachic process is essentially relegated to just uh, asmachta which sort of deflates the entire process. Like why, why spend so much energy? And if I have it from here and not from here, is there any enough coming out for that? Yeah, it's very strange. It's very strange with Arbag. I don't, I mean, that's what he writes, but I, it's very hard to, to see how that fits in with our understanding of the Talmud, I, I agree. That's definitely not the, the prevalent opinion, but it's always good to throw in a bit of a, uh, uh, I guess in America we would call a knuckleball. I don't know exactly what uh, in the UK you would, uh, the equivalent would be. Curveball. curveball. Uh, a curveball. Okay. A curveball. Okay. Um, can, I, can, can I ask the Diane, uh, when you say that the, the, Ram, the Ramban classifies these as the Rabbanan, you, not just for the count, but for all the ramifications of, you know, whether you've been Mahal Shabbat for a sick person, you know, he, 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 he's going the whole way and saying these things are, in, in the case of, for example, you, you, you brought testimony from your wife's family, mm. uh, you know, I don't know what the consequences might be, I haven't thought through what the consequences might be, yeah. but he says in all these halachic consequences, we therefore treat them as Durabanan. It's not just in the counting of the 613 mitzvot, it's correct. across the board, is it? Yes, correct. Okay, That's my you. understanding. But again, but it's not it's not everything which is Yudim and Bidot Shatoran Beshem. That's what I was trying to qualify. A good, good proportion of the Yudim and Bidot Shatoran Beshem would actually be details within the Torah law, in which case they would be, would be from the Torah law. 
the, when it's adding on to, then I, I think it's really the Rabbanan, and that's one of the strong examples for it. For example, if let's say I would um, do Kiddushin in front of false witnesses, right, then the Kiddushin are no good Mina Torah, but that's only if the witnesses are invalid from the Torah, but if they're only invalid Mid Rabbanan, then the status is different. That would be a ramification. So if I take a maternal relative, uh, rather than a paternal relative as a witness, then according to the Rambam, according to the other Rishonim, that would be invalid from the Torah, the Kiddushin that I do in front of those witnesses. According to the Rambam, it would be different because that's only a Dirabanan uh, 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 pro- invalidation. Uh, yeah, for, for the witness. Thank you very much. That's very, that helps. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, if possible. Yeah, so I have one question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, hi, Daniel. You, you said very quickly that um, the, the Rambam was the only person to write a book trying to say, okay, you know, this will be the only book you need, right? And um, But the Mam lawyers made the same claim. And I thought it was a trend. Obviously not, right? So what what's what's going on here? Is, is, uh, you know, because I thought that uh, the, the Hafez Chaim obviously tried. He only got a quarter of the way through. Uh, um, so, can, could you? Um, yeah, I mean, nobody, nobody's really been able to to do it since. In other words, I don't think even the Rambam meant that you don't need any other books. But you know, that's a whole other discussion. But, um, but. Um, but you know, there, like you said, there have been some who've started the project, but nobody's really done it in entirety, at least in my understanding, like the Rambam did. The Geonim started to write works on subjects rather than just writing commentaries on the Talmud. That was done before the Rambam. But to write a book of Alakha entirely on everything systematic in that way, he, he's really unique. Thank you. Now, the the, the, the in the introduction, he he, he sort of laments the, the loss of knowledge, um, you know, people, especially with the Ottoman Empire at the time. And it was sort of written for people who, who didn't know how to read Hebrew, he says that, right? So, uh, which is different to the Rambam, which he, which he was also, you know, it, it, was, it was for the scholar as, as well as for, for the person who didn't right. know anything about Halakha. So there, it was a bit of a different target audience, which I think in, in the introduction to the Mam he does make that um, point. Just, mm. Even the Rambam himself, he writes that in the letter that he didn't mean that you shouldn't learn any other books. He himself, he himself taught the Rif and other books as well. It wasn't that he thought you should throw everything else to, uh, to the recycle bin. <laughs> Anybody else? Or can the Rav go to bed now? It's 11.40 for the Rav. Yeah, still early. <laughs> still early. No more questions? Okay. Thank you all very, very much for being here. Daniel Livner, really, really, really honored to have you again. You've enriched us again. Looking forward to seeing you here teaching the Talmudium again. Everybody, please remember next week we've got.